I'd like to welcome you to a friendly discussion among friends. <laughs> uh, and among friends of Gerhard Richter and among people who have worked with him in different capacities over a considerable length of time, but who come at their work from quite different angles. Um, the reason I'm doing this is not, in fact, that this is my program, but uh, we were discussing who should start, and I suppose the uh, Mikasa Sukasa uh, kind of rule applies here. So, since I'm the only American here, I will wear, welcome Hans Ulrich Oberst and Kurni Welts uh, to this okay. conversation, and then I will welcome myself, and my name is Robert Storr. <laughs> um, the, the occasion of sorts, aside from uh, Gerhardt's ubiquitous presence at the art fair, uh, is also that Karina has just made. Uh, I guess the third film uh, of a, a group of films that she's made working very closely with Gerhard Richter. Uh, and you must understand that Richter is not somebody who particularly likes to be pursued by cameras uh, or particularly likes to sort of open his uh, working routines and daily life to inspection. So it's a, an extraordinary thing that she's been able to do this, that she's been able to do essentially three versions. And as I understand it, the most recent is based an archival material and concerns his earlier phase of West German life in Dusseldorf, where he attended the Dusseldorf Academy and was a student uh, along with uh, uh, Sigmar Polka, um, uh, Mickey Palermo, and numbers of other people. Um, the first installment was devoted to a project that he made in the Cologne Cathedral, uh, and the in between one, the longest of them, to my knowledge, uh, is a film which really gives you as good a view as you will ever have of Richter in the process of making paintings, mostly abstract paintings, in fact, entirely abstract paintings. And that film will be shown tonight, I believe, at 8 o'clock at the Colony Theatre? Colony Theatre, yes, at the Colony Theatre. Colony Theatre. Theater. So yeah. now I have done my job as the Toastmaster, uh, welcomer, greeter, touch shore of this occasion. Um, so maybe we could ask a little bit uh, from Karina about the film itself and just sort of start there. Yeah, I'm ha very happy to be here. Um, when I started filming, that was in uh, 2006, I first began to uh, f make a project on the cathedral window. Uh, Gerhard Richter planned for the cathedral in Cologne. And um, because I know that he was very uh, shy in situations of interviews, I had the idea that to invite others uh, companions he knows over quite a lot amount of time and therefore um, I invited Hans Ulrich Oberst and also Robert Starr to have uh, conversations with him. Um, w we did that and uh, parts of the conversation you did uh, were in the cathedral window film and um, when we spoke about the project, uh, Hans Ori said, uh, oh, that's an interesting um, approach. You are gathering archive material. And that was at this moment not at all in my mind, because as a filmmaker, you are always uh, have to take care of the budget. And uh, at that time, we didn't have any funding yet. And so. <coughs> I didn't really know what you meant, but later I thought that was really th exactly the right idea to see it in this way because uh, TV doesn't uh, uh, gather archive material anymore. It's everything is recorded and then thrown away. And therefore, um, I was so thankful that you mentioned this great, great idea. And later on, I uh, had a long interview with Robert Starr in Cologne, and uh, you did a wonderful uh, telephone interview with Gerhard Richter on uh, the, the early years, Fluxus, and um, John, uh, the influence of John Cage. Mm. But um, now I see it as a really wider range of material, and I will uh, see uh, how it will work out for other projects. Yeah, it's, it's an extraordinary film, and uh, for those of you who haven't seen it, really very urgent to, to go and see it in the, in the cinema uh, tonight, because it's, I think, in many different ways to do also, it's a strange echo, in many different ways also got to do with the fact how, Corinna, you, you really introduced a lot of different kind of 
yeah, inventive new possibilities how to do a documentary. I mean, as you said, I think this idea of bringing in interlocutors who have spoken with Gerhard many times before was one way of making it polyphonic, and uh, I think that was, uh, was certainly very interesting. Then also the idea that these interviews with Gerhard could happen in all kinds of different ways. I mean, Rob's interview via the telephone, then um, the, the interview in the studio, then the unrealized interview in the mountains, walking. Yeah. Um, so the idea, you know, that there are lots of different interview situations, but also the idea that really it seemed to have been a conversation with the artist and you, which really led him also to 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 contribute in a, in a very direct way to the film. And I mean, one of the things which is so fascinating is that there are moments when all of a sudden it became maybe too difficult for him to, to work with the camera around, I mean, the film crew around. And then there is this very fascinating moment where the filming continues without the filmmaker, where you just left the cameras behind. And, um, and then Gerhard would paint and the cameras would film him anyhow, which I think is a very, very interesting idea. And even more interesting, this moment then about the soundtrack, when at some moment uh, Gerhard got very directly involved by actually doing this piano, um, yeah. piano piece, which is, uh, his own sort of soundtrack, which he contributed to the film. So I think in many different layers, it's, it's, um, it's an extraordinary uh, documentary. I mean, one thing I wanted to tell is just this anecdote that Corinna rang me and also Gerhard Richter rang me and suggested this idea of going to Cologne and do the interviews. And it's always been uh, with Gerhard doing interviews, we, we try to focus on one topic, no? so that it wouldn't so somehow be uh, about everything, but we try to focus. So we had just done one interview about him and architecture. We started to do long interviews about him and his extraordinary books, the sort of artist books as, a, as an aspect in his practice. And then, of course, Corinna was doing this film. And at the beginning, and that's what you don't see in the film you're going to see tonight, it's the predecessing film right before that, which is this um, uh, actually 23 meter high stained window glass, which is permanently installed in the Cologne Cathedral. Um, which uh, uh, is an extraordinary piece made out of <coughs> actually 11,000 hand-blown squares in 72 colors, which are all derived from the palette of the original medieval glazing that was destroyed during World War II. And this piece, whenever um, you will be, whenever you will be in um, in Cologne, it's a permanently installed piece in the in the cathedral, and we we recorded the whole uh, uh, conversation, which Corinna filmed about coincidences, about chance about the binary logic of sort of, um, thank you, about the binary logic of yes and no decisions. Gerhard says picture making consists of a multitude of yes and no decisions with a yes to end it all. And um, it was a very, very f uh, fascinating conversation where actually all these um, uh, many, many different shades and uh, have all to do with repetition and difference. And then we thought we had concluded the, the interview and Gerhard and I were actually not aware that the camera was still running. Uh, and so finally, and it's a kind of a classic that the most interesting thing happens in a conversation when you think the camera is switched off, right? Because suddenly mm. it was a sort of a, a moment of relaxation because the tension was gone, no? Of having recorded an hour and a half. And Gerhard and I walked through the studio and we looked at his uh, paintings, which are now called the cage paintings, uh, and which at that time didn't have a title. And they were just about to be shipped to Rob's Biennale in Venice, where they uh, were shown in a, in a room in the, in the main pavilion. Um, and the interview was finished, and Gerhard thought, you know, we could discuss about the issue of the title, because he said these paintings don't have a title yet, and he's really urgently looking for a title, because they're going to go to Rob's show, and he needs to send to the Biennale the title of the work. And uh, so neither he nor I realized that Corinna was behind us and was filming it. <laughs> that fragment is now on the bonus of the film. Um, and it's, uh, the DVD is basically uh, an addition, has lots of additional elements. That's, I mean, another thing which I think is interesting about the notion of the archive, that you've got the film which is in the cinema, which Corinna edited, and then a lot of archive materials are now added to the, to the DVD. And I remembered the moment when Gerhard asked about the titles, I remembered that at the very beginning when we met, when I was a student, I uh, started to organize the first exhibition of, uh, of his work, which we curated in the Nietzsche House in Sils Maria. It was an homage to the philosopher Nietzsche in the Swiss mountains with many you know, uh, photographs and, and paintings. And, 
And at that time, I had all kinds of ideas for titles, like lots of philosophical titles which came from Nietzsche. And Gerhard thought they were all very embarrassing and we needed to sort of not use them. And he said we should make it very simple because he said titles which last are very short, laconic, simple titles. And so he really taught me the methodology of finding a title which I've, I've applied ever since. It's, uh, it's to reduce it until it becomes a laconic title. And he said, where does the exhibition take place? So I said, Sils Maria. He said, too long. Uh, and then we called the exhibition Sils. So we sort of thought we need to go back to his own methodology of finding a very short title. And then I asked him what music he was listening to um, whilst he actually did these extraordinary abstract cage paintings. And he said he was listening a lot again and again to the music of John Cage. And the moment he pronounced Cage, uh, and Corinna has it all on film, we both looked at the painting and suddenly realized the incredible uh, aspect that obviously Cage is an homage to John Cage, but Cage is also a cage. And the very nanosecond it was pronounced, Gerhard decided that these are tasks, and I immediately communicated it to Rob. So I thought yeah. because we're here all together. I'll well, it was, it, was, it was fortuitous because, in fact, that exhibition had as a sub-theme uh, in a number of the artists chosen uh, people who had been influenced by Cage, and Ellsworth Kelly was one room away from Gerhardt, and Cage was crucial to Ellsworth's work. There was a Japanese artist who was there, so it was sort of like happy, happy circumstance. But I'd like to talk about the film a little bit because, you know, there, there are any number of fictional films uh, from the very good film on Edward Munch to the very famous, but I won't say good film on uh, Vincent van Gogh, in which uh, the, the filmmaker tries in some way to capture art in the making, uh, the process of painting. Um, but the process of painting is not what most people think it is. And it's wonderful finally to have a film where you see somebody actually working with the materiality of paint. I mean, there's a lot, actually you hear it on the soundtrack, you hear the, the squishy sound of paint and great, great quantities of it. Uh, you see the cleaning of tools, you see what it is that a painter does, which is very much like what any workman does. It's, it's, it's a métier. And the thing you can't see is what Hans Ulrich is describing, which is the decision making. But mm -hmm. for people who may be tempted to see the paintings that Richter's made with squeegees and so on and so forth as, as simple, uh, as something that's easy to do, first of all, it belies that, absolutely. Physically, it's extremely demanding. You know, if, if uh, de Kooning or Franz Klein or who has it made a gestural brush like this, it, that's a relatively simple physical act compared to moving this enormous tool across these very large surfaces, moving quantities of extremely heavy uh, viscous material. So it really, I think, uh, in a positive way, demystifies painting and then allows you actually to be really impressed by what goes on, because how do you embark on making something that large with that much room for accident or contingency and then realize that the art of it is deciding when to stop, uh, when to make a move. And one parenthetical thing, in this exhibition at the Alexander Gray Gallery, there's a painting made by an American painter named um, Jack Whitten, made in 1974 and made by exactly the same technique. And Jack is an artist I've known for a long time, and he developed this technique in a very different direction. But this single painting, which predates anything that Gerhard did, um, is not obviously an influence on Gerhard because Gerhard couldn't possibly have known about it. But it's a case of where two artists come upon a same technical operation and do utterly thing, different things with it, which is to say that Gerhard's work is distinctive not because he does what he does methodologically, but again because of the choices he makes about what to keep, what to bury, and indeed in one other painting which is in this exhibition you can clearly see one of his photo-based candle paintings being erased by an abstraction. So that the, the, the process of deciding is, what it, is where the art lies. Yeah, I think that it's, uh, for me it was very important to see when he works with the squeegee, the squeegee had the size of the canvas. So when he, uh, when he puts the squeegee over the canvas, he's every time risking the whole painting. That's, uh, that's what the thing which wasn't clear to me before, because uh, afterwards it has totally changed. The colors have changed, and therefore these decisions are so um, often so risky and uh, so important. And for me, when I was in the studio watching him uh, working, it was really exciting because you are all the time confronting 
confronted, and I hope that will be the same for the viewer of the film, confronted with your own uh, way of thinking and with your own judging a painting. Because sometimes I saw uh, uh, saw the painting and then I thought, well, that's that looks good. And then in the next step, the squeegee uh, went over the painting and it has totally changed. So. I think that's also a point which Gerhard wants, uh, or which he expressed in the film, that seeing is not so easy as you think it is, because there is al al always a decision in it. And uh, he said that's the same for the artist and for the viewer who sees the painting in, in, a, in a gallery or in a museum, that, that he is has the same uh, task to decide whether what he thinks about, whether it's good or bad, and uh, there the artist and the viewer is equal. And all these thoughts I tried to uh, to get in the film. So uh it's also again the the, the 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 amplification of the complexity of the painting by this choice of tool. If you use a brush, even a fairly broad brush, you affect a relatively narrow zone. And so, whereas every other relationship in the painting will be altered somewhat, in this case, the entire surface is altered. And for him to take account of what he has done after having done it is an incredibly exacting process. It's also why one can look at those paintings for so long, because there's something that happened here and something that yeah. happened here, and it's all, you know, it's everywhere. Yeah, it's also that the paintings have an inside yeah. that's there's a surface, but there, there's an inside these uh, many layers, uh, and he's working uh, on these paintings over months. So uh, that's an interesting aspect, I think. But I think that's very, very essential because I think what, what you both mentioned has been somehow maybe connected also to something I felt very strongly in the film, which is a sort of a paradoxical thing that it's both full of very quick moments, but then also slow. It's yeah. and, and I think in some kind of way, I mean, there is this moment of the surprise. I mean, Gerhard says surprises always emerge, disappointing or pleasant ones, no? And I mean, this whole idea uh, of surprises which happen in the working process is so, so wonderful to see in, uh, in your film. But then obviously there are these long moments, I mean, it made me almost think of Heidegger's, you know, a metaphysic kind of idea of the long while, is that the word in English? Yeah, the the long while, when there is a sort of a slowness of a long while, yeah. mm -hmm. um, which Heidegger describes. And I think this extraordinary slowness that at some point a very fast process then has to stay in the studio for weeks and weeks until he decides in which direction the process goes. Uh, and at some point, which he also says that, I mean, because then the painting has to last forever. And I think in some kind of way, um, one of the things which struck me and which I think is really extraordinary, Corinna, about your film is this idea is to have allowed this time because it took a lo long time and there were pauses, there were intervals, there were several months when you interrupted the, the shooting of the film. And so it was the opposite of a rushed process. And I think that's also why it succeeded because mm -hmm. I think very often these whole deadlines with films and particularly mm -hmm. with documentaries. Uh, or TV documentaries can be very detrimental, you know, and I think this sort of idea of it being um, about slowness. And I was wondering, I mean, one of the things which that obviously needs uh, is a producer who plays the game, because very often, you know, the rush is there because of uh, economy and because of also deadlines. Mm. And I was wondering if you can talk a little bit about that process, because I remember when we were, you made an interesting presentation in London when the film was launched. It had its premiere in London, the eve of the retrospective of Gerhard at the, at mm. the Tate, this extraordinary show, which is, which is still on at the Tate Modern. And uh, the eve of this, of this opening, you presented the film, and then you and the producer had a conversation. And it was very interesting, because it had a lot to do with the fact that he was also patient. And see, he seems an unusual producer. Yes, he's uh, Thomas Kufus. Uh, he's based in Berlin. And that was really uh, a very uh, big um, and special production, because uh, he allows me uh, to do uh, the filming the way I wanted, and I stopped uh, counting shooting days, which can be very expensive <laughs> too, <laughs> because normally I'm used to, to, to work quick and, and, and to, to uh, accept the deadlines, but this time it was different. And that was, uh, I think, the, the very special process that 
uh, I wasn't controlled by the producer and I wasn't controlled by the artist because Gerhard, uh, he said when it was okay for him to film and when not, but he uh, never asked for the material or, or tried to, to control uh, uh, the process of editing and that was, there were two, I never had a situation like this and maybe therefore it, it's such a, uh, the result is um, the were way it is. Were there any realist paintings in process in the studio while you were working and did you get any chance to film how they proceeded in stages? Because I've been in the studio and seen uh, almost it's like um, kind of um, shortcut, uh, you know, film cuts, outtakes, because you see the painting one day, you come back three or four days later, it's different the yeah. next day. But I don't think there's any footage of him painting, uh, a, a, an image painting, is there? And, and did you ever have I a chance? I, ha I have some footage, yeah. but it wasn't enough to, uh, to show the whole process of the, for example, yeah. bouquet and uh, the albino painting. So. Uh, well, now that he trusts you, you should uh, press to, <laughs> to, to do that, actually. It'll be very interesting, I think. That's interesting. That's almost, that's almost like the, the, it could be the next film, or it's an unrealized film, because I wanted to ask you, now that you've you know, achieved this film, it's the second film you did on Gerhard, um, what's your next film? Do you have another documentary in the, in the making? Uh, I finished the film because, for me, it's a trilogy with a Windows film, the uh, film about the abstract paintings, the long film, and then now a short film uh, about the painting uh, Emma Nude on a Staircase and his early years in Düsseldorf um, with Sigmar Polka and Konrad Luke and uh, in the studio Fürstenwald uh, 204. That was a very important place, his first studio, where he stayed from uh, 63 until 71. So all this entire uh, uh, early uh, photorealistic paintings are made there and uh, for the small film he, uh, he designed the studio uh, and I filmed that, but the next film will be, I think, about, uh, about literature, so no art. <laughs> <laughs> Enough. I mean, it's interesting that because uh, if, you, if you think of where he began as an artist, I mean, he began as a figurative painter, basically, and went through a phase of trying to find uh, a semi-abstract vocabulary and then began to make photo-based paintings, but the abstract paintings became a central part of his activity relatively late, or at least the kind of abstract paintings we're talking about where there's active agitation and, and, and mixture of colors and so on. And there was a lot of misunderstanding of them in this country as being expressionist paintings in some fashion when they were first widely seen. Uh, and they coincided with the moment of the Berliner Freiheit group and all this, but, but you know, Richter is not an expressionist painter. And I think actually when you watch him make these uh, paintings with big squeegees, mm -hmm. there's as much visual excitement as in would one would find in a gestural abstract expressionist painting, but it's an entirely different uh, mood and methodology. He is by and large not moving fast. He is not expressing a preordained topic. He's not purging his psyche. It's, it's a different kind of approach and it's, it's, it's it's a challenge, if you will, to the vocabulary that we often use for that kind of painterly painting. Mm -hmm. But I think also what the film makes clear by actually focusing so much on the abstract paintings and on the process of the abstract paintings is, as we say, I mean, there, there could be many, many other films. And, and I think this sort of whole idea that there are so many dimensions to Gerhard mm -hmm. yeah. um, is also something which, I mean, I'm doing these ongoing interviews with him and, and now at the moment we are doing very long interviews on his books and I mean, it's very fascinating, like uh, at some point, I would say in the last five, six, seven years, mm -hmm. suddenly this idea of doing artist book has become unbelievably present in his work. He's always done it, he's always been involved in his own catalogs, he's had amazing inventions of layouts and I mean, his very first catalog was actually a book which he, a little catalog he did with Sigmar Polke with a Peri Rodan text collage and then image collage, mm -hmm. which is a pure artist book, uh, and that's still in the 60s. Uh, and ever since, you know, many, many books of his are artist books, but in the last six, seven years, there is any, a very, very big density of such books. I mean, uh, the book on the forest, for example, um, Wald, 
uh, which is an extraordinary magnum opus of many, many photographs he did um, in the forest nearby his studio. That's also something yeah. which tangentially enters the film, mm -hmm. uh, the proximity of the forest uh, uh, to the studio. Um, and then at the same time, you know, the idea that more and more with these books, like also Warcraft, no, which is a details, revisits a Halifax book, where he revisits uh, a painting, uh, an older painting, and makes many, many photographs of details. But more and more he adds this idea, actually, of a, of a, of a text collage. And it's very often a random text collage of a ready-made text, which he finds. And I mean, these are not only extraordinary artist books because of their content, but also because of the form. He invents real layouts. Uh, and whenever one visits the studio in the last couple of years, there are these big tables you know, with these artist books. So that's a whole other dimension. So it is like in super string theory, you know, with 11 dimensions. There are at least 11 dimensions to, to Gerhard Richter. <laughs> well, it's interesting, too, because now when, 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 the, when the, the book was made in Halifax, which were details of paintings shot obliquely and almost as if landscape, um, and then since then many others, there was a strong tendency in certain art critical quarters to say actually he is destroying painting and increasingly objectifying it, displacing it, working against it, and moving in favor of photo reproductive means. So if you have a film like yours where it's absolutely clear that he's 100% a painter and 100% a conceptual artist, that's something that nicely messes up uh, the sort of dichotomous situation that's prevailed in criticism. Just if I can throw in one anecdote, by the way, when I was, when I was working, I can't remember what phase of it, but um, at one of the phases of the show that I did at the Modern, uh, I went to see him in Cologne. And uh, at that time in Bonn, there was a major retrospective of mm -hmm. Robert Ryman. Um, and Gerhardt mostly doesn't talk about other artists, and he doesn't mostly talk that favorably about other <laughs> artists that come up who are just sort of in the wind, fashionable or whatever. But he deeply respected uh, Ryman. I'd known this. And I said, you know, that after we had our meeting and so on, I was going to get in a car and go there. And he said, no, no, let's go together. So he jumped in his BMW and drove at top speed uh, from uh, Cologne to, to Bonn. And when I got to the show, uh, I looked, I, I'd made an exhibition with Ryman, so I knew the work very well, so I looked in a certain way. He hadn't seen a Ryman show for a long time, and he crawled the walls to sort of absorb it all. And you could see him responding precisely to the sort of poetic materiality of Ryman's work in a way which you can imagine is synthesized not as an influence, but as a kind of a, an alternate path that he can think about as he does what he does in the same vein. I mean, but that dialogue, just watching him look, was, it was amazing. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if we should open it to the floor, if there are questions uh, to Corinna uh, about the film or any questions. Sure, Elliot Stultz from Chicago. I'm, uh, and I apologize, I got here late, so if you covered this at the beginning of the lecture, uh, just tell me. I'm curious, what made you choose Gerhard Richter, Richter as a subject? I think we were chosen because they wanted a conversation about Gerhard Richter. <laughs> <laughs> so it goes that way. Uh, this was organized by, the, by, the, by the, uh, the art fair, but all of us have worked with Richter, that's why we're here. Don't be bashful. <laughs> well, maybe I could ask Hans Ulrich, if you could talk a little bit more about your sort of, your, your, she's doing ongoing films, you're doing ongoing interviews. Uh, and of course, you edited a, a, a massive book of texts and interviews, uh, which now needs a second volume, probably. Um, uh, how, how is this relationship with Gerhardt sort of uh, developed over the years as these conversations have continued? Yes, I mean, basically, it, the, the beginning was this, uh, was actually this exhibition in, in Sils Maria, which I mentioned, no? So it was yep. a, a very, very small show in the Swiss mountains. Uh, and um, uh, that was, was uh, in, the, in the early 90s. And then I started to work with, with Kaspar Koenig, and we, we did this painting show called The Broken Mirror, where we tried to gather paintings you know, at the beginning of the 90s of many different generations, and Gerhard played a very important role in this show. And Kaspar had this great idea, because he says, you know, very often in his experience, when he did von Hierhaus and Westkunst, because he, mm -hmm. he did all these pioneering shows, 
um, and which obviously Gaha played a pivotal role, like big room in you know in front in front here house just spoke about it yesterday, which is sticks so strongly in you know in the memory. Um, and uh, and Kasper said, you know, it's very interesting when he worked on on von Hiraus and Westkunst. Very often, artists do amazing writing. So let's just ask all the artists to send us a text about their work for the catalog. And uh, and Gerhard sent us an amazing you know note, uh, that sort of a diary uh, had to do with his diary entries. Uh, and I was very very curious to then find out more, and that sort of was the trigger of these conversations. And uh, we started to. Uh, to research and, and uh, spend a lot of time in his archive and found actually that there was a lot of writings. There are also his letters. There are obviously uh, moments, uh, you know, when he reacts against something. There are kind of letters of, of protests also in the book. And then the interviews, the many interviews he gave. So around 94, 95, he published the first um, uh, volume of that book. And, and here again, he uh, actually uh, was very involved in the layout. He illustrated it with. Uh, um, with images, and uh, what then happened is somehow that then you know we worked on many other shows and many other projects, but at some point the interviews became more specific about one aspect which he had not talked about yet. Because in some kind of way, I started to read so many interviews. I mean, I read your amazing, very very long interview, of course, which happened for the for the MoMA show, and that entered then the extended volume, no, of the second uh, um, of the second book, because it's it's now almost double the size of the first uh, volume, because he. Mm. He wrote, but also he gave many, many more interviews in the last 10, 15 years. Uh, the many different interviews also of Benjamin Buchlow. And reading all these interviews again and again, editing the book, I felt it sort of became urgent not to ask him the same questions again. So we started to find niches, aspects about which he had never spoken. And I mean, one thing which was interesting was that I realized that architecture played actually a big role in his work. Because if one looks at the atlas, very early on he imagines imaginary utopic architecture for his paintings. He imagined spaces which would be built for his paintings and which were never realized, never meant to be realized, as he told me. But still, uh, the, the connection to architecture was strong. And then he started to also build his own studio at some point and made the architecture for that. And so we did a very long interview for Domus just about his whole, whole relationship to architecture. And now, obviously, in the last couple of years, the book's becoming so important. I realized there had never really been an interview about the books. and so. That's the thing we're working on. We're working on now. And what about your conversation? Because you've done this very, very, very long interview. Well, I've done. I've done several. I did a. Um, Michael Blackwood made a film, uh, which was Gerhard and me talking with Katarina Manchanda, who was my collaborator on the show at MoMA. Um, my German is pretty negligible, I have to say. Um, his English is serviceable. Um, what we have in common is visual languages, so we can respond to things together and so on. But whenever I've done an extended interview, I've needed a, a, a translator, and he's wanted a translator. But my experience basically is that uh, he's a man who is simultaneously reticent and eager to set things right. And he, it's almost like a trap for him. He wants to get it right, but he doesn't want to talk. Yeah, that's <laughs> And true. when he wants to get it right, he doesn't necessarily want to get it right in the sense of all the facts here and there are in place. He wants to get the understanding of something right, but sometimes the facts alter a little bit. And he even confesses to this, because it's not that he tells an untruth the first time. He tells only part of a truth, which then people take in a certain way. And then he comes back later and tells the other part of the truth. And indeed, in your book, in the first in the daily practice of painting, um, you know, he more or less says at some point, you know, I couldn't say these things before because of the prevailing context and how I would have how they would have been understood. Now I can say these things. And most of them have to do with uh, emotional and political and social issues where he didn't want to seem to pronounce on things in a way that would trap him into a, 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 a artistic models that he didn't want to have any part of. But now he's more forthcoming, but he's still an onion and we'll still keep peeling him for a long time. Yeah, I think the interesting thing is that uh, when I read your interview too, um, is that he somehow manages uh, to get the interviewer to answer some question uh, his own. Yes. So <laughs> that is very, that's a very uh, tricky thing he does because then he is excited about the answer the interview gave, uh, is giving about his works. So. Well, uh, Gerhard didn't like Louis Bourgeois' work at all, 
Um, I happen to like both Gerhardt's work and Louise Bourgeois' work, and Louise had the same ability to turn the tables on anybody talking yeah. to her. So there's a, there's a, there's a kind of a, a, a kind of chess game going on back and forth with people of this caliber and of this subtlety, always. And it's also interesting if you think about this sort of writing and, and talking about the work, because I mean, in, in the US, if you think about Barnett Newman, no, whenever Barnett Newman did a major work, it was kind of preceded by a very lengthy period of writing, no, and reflection, yeah. and, and which one can find in Barnett Newman's collected writings. Or with, with Hans Hoffmann, there is permanently a didactic impulse there, no, it's a didactic impulse in his, in his interviews and in his texts. And one has neither nor in the case of Gerhard. One has, doesn't have that sort of Barnett Newman esque, you know, preceding of lengthy period of writing, and wasn't, one doesn't have the didactic impulse of Hoffmann. Sort of, it's a parallel reality once more with, with Gerhard. It's sort of the writing and talking about the work sort of runs parallel to painting, accompanies it, questioned it, and is also corrected by it. And I think that's something the film also shows in a in a very beautiful way. Mm -hmm. But I think, I mean, Gerhard admires Newman's paintings enormously, but I think he probably doesn't have much sympathy for Newman's uh, caricature of the, the, the gentleman artist, which in, in an American context worked very well uh, as a kind of unexpected dandyism, but in a general way probably is not anywhere near Gerhard's taste. <laughs> Maybe we should wind this up unless, uh, is anybody else want to have another shot at us? Um, or actually not at our, us, but at our, at our knowledge of somebody we have in common? Yes. Yeah. One second, I think they're bringing you a mic. Uh, how does Gerhard Victor see the gap or the tension between his abstract work and his photo-based work? Do you, anybody want to grab that or shall I? Okay. Um, I think the word gap by itself is, 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 is uh, without any meaning to criticize, you sort of prejudices the question a little bit. Um, he takes care to talk about his abstract paintings in German terms as abstract bildern, which means abstract pictures. A and, and he's repeatedly said that as far as he's concerned, uh, abstraction always tends toward a pictorial model that we are uh, sort of culturally uh, prepared to see things as images and to see them in terms that relate to pictures. Now this is exactly the opposite position of Ryman, even though he admires Ryman. And it's the opposite position of many abstract artists who have tried very hard to banish the pictorial and especially the representational. But it, I think for Richter, the, the, the primary thing is, is, is the pictorial fact and that both what we call abstraction and then the more representational things represent imperfect approximations of a visual phenomenon and they represent languages of picture making none of which are to be trusted or taken at face value. So the, uh, the subversive element to his work is not an attack on painting but rather an attack on the ability of any picture to stand for anything else really, but the tendency of all pictures to suggest that this might be so, so that you're caught in the longing for some kind of satisfaction from what you see and the constant reminder that it will never live up to your desires or expectation. It will always be some kind of a fiction. Hi. Um, I wanted to know how long the video is and how long it took you to make the video. How long do I work and what? How, how, long, it how is long did it take to make the video? Um, I started my research uh, for the first project in uh, 2005 and then this was an ongoing process. So, so there was, uh, the first film was finished in uh, 2007 and uh, we shoot over two years, and then the editing three or four months until the film was completed. And then when it was completed, Gerhard Richter saw the film, and um, yeah, so. Was he ever, did, did he 
find anything in it that he wanted out? Was he was he fussy about those things or? Mm, no, that was a. F I, I attended maybe that he wanted to throw some scenes out, but uh, he watched it twice and there was no uh, wish to change anything. So that's fantastic. <laughs> that's, that's fantastic. Maybe one, one thing we didn't talk about, which I think is also very interesting, is the reception of the film in Germany, that it really hit the cinemas, no? Because yeah. in some kind of way, these documentaries about art, very often one would have them for a few days in a cinema in Europe. I don't know how it's in the US, but in Europe they would come f you know, to the cinema near you for a few days, and then you know, it disappears again, and then one gets it as a DVD. But it's been in Germany in the cinemas for weeks and weeks and weeks. So it's it's more than two months. For two months, it's, it's a mainstream success. So I yeah. wonder, Corina, maybe it's interesting you talk a little bit about the reception of the film in Germany. Yeah, that, uh, that was a big surprise, because I, I really didn't know how, how the film will work out in the theaters. And uh, it started in early September. and. Uh, in, in many German cities, so we had uh, 26 uh, 35 uh, millimeter copies, which is <laughs> I never had, and uh, then the mm, people really appreciate the film, so we have more than 60,000 visitors, <laughs> and that's... Well, he's had every other prize, but maybe he'll now get a golden bear, and you will too. <laughs> <laughs> Two more questions. I'm wondering if, um, since he's so interested in, in perfection of image, why he hasn't spent more time, in your opinions, uh, on on photography or sculpture or, uh, or more uh, concrete or you know direct media like that. Well, he has made sculpture, um, and in the most recent exhibition at Marion Goodman's in Paris, there was a major new big piece made out of glass and metal framing devices and so on and so forth, which is the center of the room and is a kind of prism through which one sees all of the paintings. Uh, and he's been making sculpture since the 60s, basically. Um, and he's made photography as well. But uh, I, I think, I don't know, maybe, maybe Hans Ulrich will see this differently, but I think he, he, is, he is interested in the existing conventions and their inadequacies as much as he is interested in anything else. And therefore, he comes back to painting as a, as a, as a medium because it suggests yet further problems, if you will, in, in the nature of image making. Photography does that too, and he's done a lot of photography uh, where he cancels the photograph with the paint. And actually, uh, uh, Hans Ulrich did a beautiful exhibition, or he was at least prominently featured in that exhibition in Leverkusen, which was just, just those images. So I mean, the aggregate of, of Gerhardt's work is enormous. And in this country, we've seen only a, a thin sliver of it, all things considered. I think that's such a, an important point, yeah, that there's still so much you know, which isn't known or seen of the work and it's I think there are very few artists where there could be so many different exhibitions uh, and there will be so many different exhibitions you know which can happen with the work over many many decades to come because the work is just so complex and I mean if you think about these overpainted photographs which you know Rob, Rob mentioned that is a very very important work within the work that could be another film that could be a whole other you know it's a whole other dimension of, 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 of huge number of works which it grew out of the atlas it grew out of the working process where he actually at some point had some drips of paint on a photograph he told me that one day you know the photographs were there for the photographic paintings and by chance some color drips you know ended up on the photographs and he thought it looked great and started to do this and out of this has grown a complete oeuvre you know of overpainted photographs and that's with the exception of a few exhibitions in Europe which happened in smaller museums in Germany still unknown you know to the wider public and uh, the same thing is true for his photographic work, for his cultural work. There are just so many dimensions. That's why I was mentioning superstring before, you know. Superstring theory in science has 11 dimensions. Gerhard Richter has at least 11 dimensions. I mean, there's, there's, a, there's an anecdote which I think goes back to Barnett Newman, but in any case, uh, an artist of the 50s doing 
radical for that time abstraction, said, you know, you do something once and people don't take you seriously. You do it twice and they begin to worry and wonder. And you, if you begin to do it a lot, they begin to think that you actually mean it. Uh, and of course, the way that happens is that the more examples there are of something, the more one can see distinctions within any given category of activity and the more those distinctions count. I'm getting the, the uh, wrap up single here. So I think we're going to have to sign off. I'm sorry about whatever was that question, but here we go. So, thank you very much.